Okay, good evening. Welcome to almost Valentine's Day for our evening special. We'll just wait for a few more minutes for potential a few more people coming in. It's uh, going to be a fairly small group tonight, but nonetheless, it just makes things more interesting. So I hope you guys had a good week and now just chilling out for a Friday, TGIF. It's all good. Okay, evening Caroline, evening Jennifer, I see you guys have muted and blocked your video, which is very good. So we are going to start now, there may be a few more people coming in, like I said, it's a very small group, but nonetheless, we'll make the best of what we have. I hope we have had a good week and a finishing it with a good one and whether you're affected by COVID or not, I hope you're staying safe, that's all good. This, this month, you know, every every month we come up with a webinar and this month I've decided to do something quite special just because it is Valentine's Day and you know, everybody's celebrating love and everything. But sometimes we just forget that there is a, a very, very special love that we have for our pets. So today we're going to discuss about the love for your pet as a pet guardian. So just a little bit of myself, uh, who am I and why am I speaking to you like that? So I am a vet surgeon. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Lennon Fu. I'm a vet surgeon. I qualified back in RBC back in 2004. So I've been working for about so 16 years as a vet now. I'm also a business owner. I do own my own vet practice in Devon in the UK. Uh, I'm also a speaker, which uh, occasionally I have uh, speaking gigs like this, or I speak live to people as well before COVID. I also wrote a book, um, it's my vet for real, and that is a bit of a basis of uh, what we're discussing tonight is actually from that book, which we'll discuss more a little bit later. That's all very, very boring. I just wanted to share with you as well, I'm not only just a vet, I'm also a person just like yourself with a sense of humor. So this was done uh, before between jobs whereby I decided to cut my hair and just decided to add a twist to it. I think my ex-boss didn't really know what to say about that. It's like, yeah, I wrote the word vet on my head. I'm also a pet guardian just like yourself. So that's little Gabriel over there that we rescued. Two burly policemen brought him in. They said he was wandering in the streets of Heatherly and took him in. You can see he's quite an escape artist. He has already made a hole over there on the side and uh, I've covered with the drain pipe and he's gone on, on the side as well. So that is a uh, fairly interesting as well. I'm also a father, my two little boys. I was also in the army as an infantry officer. Occasionally, I'm a salsa dancer. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because it's so easy to remember people as who they think they say they are. So people just see me as a vet and not more than that. People may see you like a dog trainer, not more than that. Or people may see you for your profession. But I think we all know we are more than that. So I just wanted to share with you to say that, no, I'm, I'm just, just like yourself. I just happen to be a vet. But we also do other things as well. We are parents, we are friends, we are somebody's son, somebody's daughter. We're all quite human, really. And I do believe there's a great level, a much higher level of humanity that we should all embrace together. And despite what we are doing, because in the end, it is all about relations. So what are we going to talk about tonight for Valentine's Day special? We're going to touch upon this particular topic of ownership versus guardianship. Are you really a dog owner or merely a dog guardian? And when I use the word merely, I'm not belittling. I'm just uh, simply stating that, you know, maybe the word owner, maybe not the accurate one, but we will discuss that in a little bit. I also want to show you how you are your pet guardian as the CEO, you know, chief executive officer of your animal. And I hope to empower you so that you feel like that. How many times do you feel going to the vets that you know you have really no idea, you're really not in control? You have people who say that you know they they are 
they are wanting to do good for you, but you actually do not really know exactly what they are going on about. You may have brought your pet to, you know, the physiotherapist or something like that, and you just have, you don't feel in control. So tonight we want to empower you for that. Let me talk a little bit about news. So just to start off, did you know that in the UK, it's estimated that incredibly 12 million households have pets? And with around 51 million pets owned, of which 9 million are dogs and 8 million are cats, unsurprisingly, 88% of them saying having a pet improves their quality of life, which is why they have it. And in the same year, a whopping 4.7 billion, 4.7 billion was spent on pet-related products and 5.2 billion pounds was spent on vet bills and related services. The cost of owning a dog you know, for his entire life in the UK is about six and a half, uh, you know, six and a half thousand to seventeen thousand pounds, depending on the size. And this does not even include the vet bills. So, pet guardianship, you know, it is a responsibility filled with immense physical, mental, financial, and emotional demands. As many have described, it is like having a child. Vast amount of time, energy, and effort are expected and needed. You may have heard of pet guardians who have sacrificed traveling because of their pets. You may also know of some friends who have really modified their cars, especially fitted for their dogs. What about a couple that converted their home into a rehab unit and dedicated their entire lives to saving wild birds just for that one little chance that they might be released in the wild again? Perhaps you know someone like that. Maybe it is you. So we're going to talk about pet guardianship. You know, we want to discuss the pros and cons and maybe perhaps why you chose to become a pet guardian. We also discover whether pet guardianship is actually beneficial for the pet or not. We will then conclude with finding out, okay, ownership versus guardianship, which is more appropriate. I would like you to imagine a toaster. Just hold on to that thought. Do you own a toaster? Hold on to the thought. Okay, so having a pet, there are so many reasons why having a pet may be a good for you. You know how much your furry or non-furry friend boosts your, in, your quality of life. But it's not all just about unconditional love, although that does put, uh, sort of uh, produces a wellness boost too. On an emotional level, emotionally, owning a pet can also decrease depression, stress, and anxiety. And health-wise, it can lower your blood pressure, improve your immunity, and even decrease your risk of a heart attack and stroke. But there is actually more. You know, in 2002, there was a study done in the State University of New York in, at Buffalo. Researchers over there, they found that when conducting a stressful task, people experienced less stress when their pets were with them compared to when a spouse family member or a close friend was nearby. Make sure you don't tell your family. While some studies have found a stronger connection than others, having a pet has a potential to lower your blood pressure, especially in patients who have a, sort of a, a high risk uh, or a high blood pressure or at risk of a high blood pressure. Having a pet can reduce anxiety, leading to a reduction in pain, especially when his guardian is dealing with chronic pain like arthritis or migraine. I know a Doris, who is a 75-year-old lady, who claimed that her arthritis became worse when she was without her Tito, her beloved Yorkshire Terrier. Go figure. It also improves your mood. It could be the unconditional love that they always exhibit, making you feel like a superstar, and you never ever have to explain yourself on any occasion unless you choose to. You know what it's like. You walk away for five minutes. You turn around, come back, and they look like as though they've not seen you for six months. That sort of feeling is irreplaceable. It also helps you to socialize. Owning a dog usually involves increased chance of meeting other people with a common interest. Go for walks. There is a similar effect when caring for any other pet. You have a cat. You have something in common. You have a reptile. You have something in common. That it creates a common bond with other pet guardians, which also may lead to increased interaction. In addition, there was an Austrian study that found that pet ownership that actually led to an increase in social contact 
more socialization within neighborhoods such as uh, the neighborhoods, uh, the neighbors chatting as you're walking the dogs, and even a greater perception, this is interesting, even a greater perception to observers that the neighborhood seem friendly. And also it can keep the owners fitter from walking the dog. And amazingly, amazingly, it can actually prevent strokes and reduce heart attacks. It is believed that having a cat will reduce your chances of having a stroke by 30% and heart attack by 40%. Can you imagine just having a cat? It can be used to monitor the blood sugar levels in diabetic patients. According to the American Diabetes Association, Diabetic Forecast Magazine, a 1992 study found that one third of the pets living with diabetics, mostly dogs, but other pets does include cats, birds, and rabbits, they would actually change their behavior when their guardian's blood glucose level dropped. Like Casper, a yellow Labrador, would bark and look for his guardian whenever his 10-year-old son was starting to have a seizure episode. So they're almost like the early warning device. You know, in addition, it also prevents allergies and increases immunity. Studies have shown that children who grow, uh, who grow up on farms or around animals have a lesser chance of getting allergies. How interesting. The more pets you grow up with, the lesser the allergies. So unsurprisingly, it also helps the children to develop Having a pet can allow your children to relate to others and allow them to express their feelings better. You feel safer. Don't forget, if you're at home alone, having a pet can make you feel safer. Also, burglars are less likely to target a house that is clearly home for a dog, especially a guard dog like a German Shepherd. But frankly, simply any size dog with a deep, loud bark would do. All in all, the general feeling seems to be that uh, in having a pet, creates positive emotions and is tremendously great for your health. But I suspect you already knew that, isn't it? Is it all so smooth sailing? So having a pet is not all fun and games. If you can't take this, don't get a pet. There are certainly obvious challenges uh, involved as well. It can certainly limit your movement so you may not be able to go as far as you go. You may feel, rightfully or wrongfully, you're unable to leave your pet for an extended period of time, so holidays may be sacrificed. You may also feel obliged or restricted that you can only go to pet or dog-friendly places so that it may limit the options of going out as well, like going to the aquarium or going to certain restaurants. Also, pet guardians, they have mentioned that effective for not getting a new pet after their pet has passed away. Has your pet limited what you do? How do you feel about having a dog or any other pets? It can potentially also cause stress and worry. Yes, it's always give you a positive feeling, but not all pets do that. Allowances have to be made for daily activities, which would sometimes be undesirable, like a cat using a brand new couch as a scratching post, or your puppy chewing your favorite snuggly slippers, expensive leather shoes, or essential credit cards. I remember when I had a dog in my, uh, when I was young and uh, it just took my, uh, my dad's stack of credit cards and just chewed it. It was not easy to explain to my dad uh, why that is acceptable, so to speak. <laughs> like Rob got extremely stressed because Bruce, his active Springer Spaniel, was being aggressive to other dogs on walks. That wasn't a very pleasant walk. He could not let Bruce, who loved free running, loose. He tried various training classes in vain. He was torn between rehoming his faithful companion, breaking his heart, or persisting, breaking his will. Thankfully, with the right routine, Rob finally managed to crack the issue. There's a proper timing. But it did cause him extreme stress and worry for some time, and they are supposed to make our lives better. How does that work? More thought has to be involved with having a live animal in your house. When they fall sick, you know, it can cause immense worry and stress as well. Before, during, and after your vet visit, you may find it stressful getting your pet to your vet. You know how much your cat loves a car ride, nod, a nod, or waiting in a busy reception area. Who likes that? Barking dogs, smelly place, learning about the illness, and even coping with the treatment. Certainly, you may almost need to see your own doctor, and maybe, perhaps, you do. Due to the stress 
induced by your pet. So where's the fun bit then? It can also cause allergies. Sometimes instead of improving the immune system or reducing allergies, the opposite can happen. Keep in mind that allergies can grow worse each time you're exposed to the allergen. So spending a limited time, uh, so spending limited time with animals in the past is not exactly conclusive uh, proof that you're not going to be allergic to them. Really, really hard to say. If you're unsure of animal allergies, pet sitting for a friend or spending time volunteering for animal shelter might be something you want to try first. Have you got uh, any sort of pet related allergies? Think about that. Is it itchy? Does it cause you to cough, sneeze? Um, I know one of my team, ironically looking at a vet practice, whenever she sees a rabbit, her, her eyes would start streaming. So that is a pretty dramatic, but there we go. It can also cause safety or health hazards. A pet might be a fabulous addition for your young family. However, a large breed dog, for example, will require extra attention and training to make sure it is safe around your children. Similarly, aggressive types of snakes or territorial pets may not be the best addition if you have young dependents living with you. If your pet is not exactly toilet trained or has a incontinence issues, it may not be suitable if you've got a crawling young baby. So certainly if you have a compromised person living in your home, it will require more thought before obtaining a pet or the choice of your pet. Fundamentally, it is important to consider the needs of everyone in your home before getting a pet. It can be costly. You know, PDSA, they have estimated an average minimum cost of having a dog for its lifetime can be ranging between 6,500, as mentioned, to 17,000, depending on size. This is the bare minimum cost. It may escalate to 33,000 pounds if you decide or need to spend more in his ongoing care. Please bear in mind, this does not include the vet bills, and they can certainly vary from hundreds to tens of thousands, depending on the condition and treatment, exactly what is being happened, what needs to be done. Pet insurance can help in this course, especially relating to a certain vet bills. It's also important that remember, not all costs are monetary, uh, not, not, not all involving money. Emotional costs, like stress induced and time spent, are immeasurable. It also involves poop. It doesn't matter what pet you get. It will involve you clearing up your pet in some way or another. Some poops are easier to clear than others. Be prepared for it and have a strong stomach if needed. It also can truly disrupt your life. Cats, for example, are naturally nocturnal and are likely to find their way to the top of you while you try to sleep. Similarly, dogs, birds, and many other exotic animals will sometimes feel the need to make as much noise as possible in the middle of the night. Be prepared to take on these challenges when you decide it's time for your pet. That may ease your transition into pet guardianship much smoother. Like Donna, an avid pet garden, has sacrificed an entire living room to her three dogs, a vine runner and two springers. What have you sacrificed for your pet? It is best to acknowledge, understand, and accept the above before getting your pet. It may lead to greater preparation, clearer expectations, and greater joy when you're owning your pet. Do you know that feeling? Does your pet make you feel amazing at times and also tragic at times? Having a pet can certainly elicit a wide range of emotions from you. You have heard the old adage, to you, he's just a dog. To him, you are everything. As your pet's guardian, you're responsible for his emotional well-being. Whether he's happy, hungry, sad, anxious, or excited, you are actually in control of it. Perhaps you're not aware of this responsibility and did not understand that it was indeed up to you to ensure that your, fat, your, your, your pet feels as safe, contented, and happy as possible. Maybe you realize the responsibility only later and are not prepared to accept it and may feel that it's more of a burden rather than a joy. On the other hand, you may have embraced the entire responsibility from the very beginning and provided your best to provide to support your pet emotionally. Either way, it does take great courage, commitment, strength, love and conviction from you to take on the emotional responsibility on your pet. And for, for that, I salute you, being a pet guardian. A common positive feeling 
that you may have is a feeling of achievement when your pet, when you know your pet has wanted for nothing and was as happy as it could be under your care. The sense of satisfaction of providing a safe haven can be extremely gratifying. You can see it especially in young children when they feel responsible for their pet and know they have done a very good job. So that's also good for children to feel that sort of feeling. On the other hand, a common negative feeling you may have is the feeling of guilt. When something happens to your pet, it may be when he goes missing, when he gets injured, he falls sick, or just simply self-inflicted. That means, you know, there's nothing wrong with the pet. You just think there is and you feel guilty. I know a few customers, a few clients who are like that. Like Margaret always feels guilty thinking that he has made her dog, her chow chow dog Timbo fat by feeding too much and drafts, weighing him, her at her bats, even though he is in perfect body condition and is of ideal weight. Or when Timbo falls ill and she feels guilty, even though she has not done anything to bring about his illness, she just feels guilty because of the responsibility, the compassion that she has when caring for him. It is also not uncommon for you to think it is your fault when your cat goes wandering around. And cats do. Nothing to do with you. They are really have no loyalty. Thinking you've done something wrong to cause them to wonder. It really isn't the case. They are just cats. As said, it is no mean feat taking on the emotional responsibility like this. Most of the time, your pet does not really mind and it's just grateful that he has you. So please remember to be kind to yourself. Just remember that. Have you ever thought of that? You cannot, all you can talk about, all you can think about is your pet. Your phone, your mobiles are just full of photographs of your pet. Your pet has got their own Instagram page. You know exactly what I mean. Or you may know someone who does it. It's not you. You're, of, of course, extremely level-minded. So having a pet can change the way you live your life. Depending on what sort of pet, the change could be extremely drastic, like having a dog. You'll be walking out, you'll be walking, you'll be going out when it's raining. It can change your life, you know, you can't go too far, all those sort of things. Or minimal, like keeping a fish. Regardless, you'll certainly change the way you think, plan, and live your life. If you have a pet, you have to consider how your daily activities are going to affect him being left on his own. It will impact how you, how long you stay out for, uh, how many hours you can work in a job that may or may not support working from home, how far you can travel, extra provisions that if you have to be away for an extended period of time, like a holiday off of work, is your mother-in-law able to take care of the dog or is the dog too boisterous for your mother-in-law? If you're able to take your pet with you, where can you go that is pet friendly or accommodating? Either way, you'll certainly impact your choices and you'll be conscious of your pet perpetually, just like having a child. The mental responsibility can be constant, making a burden. If you're a dog guardian, you may be asking yourself, is there enough food? Have I walked my dog enough? Am I feeding too much? Am I feeding too little? Is he going to be okay if I go out for an evening? Is he going to miss me if I go away for two weeks? Is he going to cause problems when I'm not there? Is he going to be okay with his dog sitter, his kennels, his carer? Is he going to stop eating or mope around if he does not see me? Is he going to get depressed? Is he going to stop barking? Or is he going to start barking when I'm absent, disturbing my neighbors? What damage will I find when I get home? Do you ask yourself those questions? I'm sure you've got even more questions to ask. If you're a cat guardian, you may be asking yourself, you know what? I've not seen my cat for two days. Has she been run over? Is she stuck in someone's garage? Is she still alive? Is she stuck in a bush somewhere? What damage am I going to find when I get home? I hear some noises downstairs. Has he brought in mice again? Am I going to find half-eaten mice and birds in the kitchen like I sometimes do? Is my beloved cat killing too much British wildlife? Has my cat gotten into a fight? Huh? Did he win? Am I feeding him too much? If I don't feed my cat more, is he going to leave for another home to get better food? If you have a bird, you may be asking yourself, did I leave the window open? Am I feeding the right stuff? Am I providing enough mental stimulation, especially for African grey parrots? Is it too hot? Is it too cold? Maybe you have a reptile. You may be asking yourself, have I got my, husband, have I got my husbandry right? Have I succeeded in creating mother nature in the, living, uh, in the, in the tank in my living room? Am I actually doing the right thing, keeping a snake? 
These are only a few questions you may worry about. There are many, many more, I'm sure you know. The point being is that it does take up your mind space. Your energy, time and effort have been given for these mental exercises. These questions, these thoughts, they are manifested in your mind because you care for your pet. Whereas they may seem innocent and harmless, if you do not balance them with rationale, common sense and perspective, they can be overwhelming. What are your thoughts, excuse the pun, on this? I know a friend, Lucy, she actually suffers from anxiety attacks and breakdowns, even when lucky her pug is healthy. And she's concerned about her husband getting stressed about the finances of a vet visit when he next becomes ill. This is when the mental responsibility of having a pet becomes a mental burden. It's no longer joyful. You have to be careful that your mind remain positive when caring for your pet. You have got pets, which is why I salute for taking on taking this huge responsibility. What else do you have to do? The things you have to do having a pet, okay? The responsibility, the physical responsibilities of providing suitable food, basic shelter, engaging enrichment for your pet lies solely with you. There's no one else. Once you have a pet, you are completely responsible for, for fulfilling his physical needs, providing a shelter or safe haven for your pet may in involve sort of considerable expenses depending on what your pet and how much is being indulged. It does not necessarily mean buying an outdoor kennel, although those costs may not be small, but even living in a house usually involves an area or a bed of some form and uh, washing the bed and the blankets or repairing the damage done to pristine furniture or brand new shoes or anything your dog may fancy chewing or gnawing. Cats may ignore the rustic, practical scratching posts that you have bought and prefer the, to use expensive sofas or exquisite oak table legs as scratching posts in, uh, instead. You may have foregone family holidays, life-changing trips and uh, travel opportunities in your life as you may not be able to do so uh, with because you couldn't physically leave your pet. The responsibility of feeding extends from merely buying the basic complete nutrition to actually making sure the right food is given the right amount at the right time. The range of pet food, what a nightmare, has increased dramatically in the past decade, making it almost a minefield for you to choose. The responsibility of the actual feeding also lies with you, so planning has to be done to ensure your pet is fed at the right time. This may limit what you can do as you may need to be at home to make sure your pet is fed. You may get a neighbor or your friend to help you feed your pet, but it certainly is still your responsibility. Engaging enrichment is crucial to ensure your pet's mental well-being. Having a dog certainly involves daily walking at regular intervals. It can be challenging for you, depending on your personal circumstances and uh, working hours, health, and other sort of uh, various factors, really. Let's say you are keeping an African grey parrot or a Harris hawk. That would certainly involve a huge commitment to provide mental and or physical stimulation. The African, the African grey parrot has been thought to have a mental capacity of about a five-year-old child. So interaction and enrichment is critically important to keep his mind active and reduce behavioral issues. Birds of prey like the Harris hawk need to be flown regularly for similar reasons. It is important that you, you do your research before getting your pet to ensure you take on the wonderful wonderful responsibility knowingly and willingly. This will allow you to get the best out of your pet and build a fruitful, satisfying relationship. If not, it may present as a burden instead. So, what is a pet? More than just a pet. You know, no one can really pinpoint exactly when humans first started keeping dogs as pets, but estimates are range from roughly 13,000 years to 30,000 years ago. What may have started as domestication and for useful reasons for keeping a pet has evolved into strong companionship these days. Do you know that two thirds of Americans live with an animal? And according to a 2011 Harris poll, 90% of pet guardians think of their dogs and cats as members of the family. How do you feel about your dogs, your pets? These relationships have benefits. For example, in a survey by the American uh, Animal Hospital Association, 
they found that 40% of married female dog guardians reported they received more emotional support from their dog than from their husband or their kids. The research company, Kentel Global, surveyed pet guardians' attitudes towards uh, treating dogs as family members. According to the survey, dog guardians, amazingly, have about seven photographs of their dogs on display more than their children. Let's check out these crazy statistics. Over a quarter of pet guardians admit they like to pamper their pets, and women in particular, about 46%, find it hard to pass by a new toy or treat, even if they did not plan on buying it. One in five splurges 20 pounds a month on outfits for their dog or a cat. How mad! The craze sort of for sort of dressing up pets seem to set to continue with guardian spending on average of nearly 200 pounds, 200 pounds on clothes on the, for their pets. Over one in five admitting they spend up to 20 pounds on outfits each month. Can you imagine that uh, sort of uh, in, uh, in, in total UK spends, so UK spends about 10 million pounds a year on adults and so like 8 million pounds on cats. One in eight in 10 consumers have changed their grocery shopping habits. They change how they shop to save money. New, new research has shown that one, only one in 10 pet guardians have cut back on what they spend on the animal. So even if they want to save money, they do not cut back on animals. Only one in 10 does. It finds that 42% would spoil pets with treats, even though their budgets are tight. More than half of dog guardians indulging their pooches with Christmas stockings. Have you bought a Christmas stocking for your dog yet? 66% of guardians would buy accessories for their pets, including birthday and Christmas presents. A third would buy treats and gifts more often for their pets than their own partners. Mad. 246 pounds, no, 264 pounds average spend, annual spend on presents for pets. That is crazy. And 27% of dog guardians get their pet style, uh, spa style treatments. They go to the spa even. A quarter of pet guardians buy their pets' birthday presents. And in the last five years, spending on pet gifts have grown by more than a quarter million. You now, men, they're more likely to buy Valentine's Day present coming in. They're coming soon next week for their pets. Uh, have you guys got any male partners or hobbies and check it out and whether they're going to buy anything? Women are actually more likely to buy anniversary presents for their pets. Uh, and 88% of people admit spending up to 50 pounds on extravagant presents for their pets. We are certainly crazy about our pets. There's no denying that. What does your pet mean to you? Make sure you type in the chat box, what do you do for your pets? We'll explore that after this uh, presentation. So, so to sort of conclude this little chapter here, is pet ownership real? You know, remember the toaster. So we can own a toaster. If you do not want the toaster, you can put it in the cupboard. If you can even give it away. And if, uh, if it is damaged, you can either repair it or even chuck it away without thinking too much. And, um, but can you do the same for a pet? So the question is, do you really own a pet? So by now you have found that I use the word guardian instead of owner. And this is why when you own something, it belongs to you. You expect to do your bidding and you can do with what you want with it. If you do not like it, you can give it away, store it out. Okay, when you have a pet, I believe that you do not really own him. You're merely the guardian. You have to feed him, provide a safe shelter, give entertainment, and be responsible for his well-being. You cannot give him away. Well, you should not anyway, uh, unless uh, you have considered it very seriously. Store him away if he's annoying you, and certainly disposal should never be taken lightly, unlike having a toaster. He will train you, however, to make sure he receives what he needs. Yes, you definitely heard me right. He will train you. It's almost like a child. Rarely do we say we own a child. We just say that he's ours. We have to take care of him, and usually we feel obliged to take care of him, considering that we brought him to our lives anyway. So the responsibility and also burden is ours. So it is more of a pet guardianship than ownership. We are pet guardians, you and I, not really pet owners. Other words that people have used is uh, pet parent or pet carer. 
Okay, so as you know, this pet guardianship business, it can be very complicated, which is why I applaud you for being amazing pet guardians. It is also usually fraught with huge emotional, physical, mental, and financial responsibilities, and in some cases may become a burden if you are not careful. So you don't really own your pet. You just care for him. And with this comes different expectations. It's usually extremely rewarding, you know that. And you agree that by having your pet has greatly improved your overall quality of life. However, pet guardianship is not for everyone and not all pets will benefit from it. I'm sure you know examples of what exactly I mean. An ill-conceived pet guardianship can result in them being abandoned or even destroyed, potentially, physically or mentally. This leads me to the second part of the presentation tonight. Okay, so your pet guardians, I'm going to do what I can to empower you as your pet's CEO. Are you the boss? Do you feel you're completely in charge when you bring your pet to the vet? Do you feel relaxed and calm knowing that you're in total control of the outcome and situation of what happens to your pet? Are you able to detect exactly what you expect and want to see happen? Do you take responsibility of the results, whatever they might be? Do you feel you can make all decisions mindfully and nothing will be done without your expressed and informed choice? If you say, hell yeah, to all the questions I just asked, congratulations, you are the rare few and far between. If not, why not? It is, after all, your pet. Currently, you may bring your pet to your vet because he is not well and seek advice. The problem may be that it may be instantly, instantaneously solved or may require further investigation or treatment. You know, your pet may get better or God forbid not. When he gets better, you relax and may invest a little bit more time to find out what happened and if it can be prevented in future. If it does not get better, you may continue listening to your vet and hope that things will work out. Or you may seek a second opinion and hope your problems is solved then. Fingers crossed. How do you feel? Do you feel you're in control or are you at the mercy of your vet? Remember, you are in charge. Are you the boss? You should be the captain of his fate and master of his destiny. So there was this uh, particular lady, uh, Robin, Farman Farman, she wrote this uh, amazing book, The Patient as CEO. It talks about how patients should be in charge of their own health care and not leave the fate uh, up to their doctors or other para professions, uh, other pro uh, sort of para professionals. Your pet does belong to you. Just like how a chief executive officer, a CEO of a company has many departments like marketing, sales, finance, human resource, and administration to, uh, to do their sort of respective jobs. And they report back to her so the company is run as a single entity. You should do the same with your pet. You are your pet's CEO. You should be in charge of whatever happens to him in all aspects, every single aspect. Why should you give responsibility for something important like that? Your vet, your dog trainer, if you have one, behaviorist, dog walker, should all be working for you, not the other way around. You would not give up control of who you are, what you wear, where you play, when you play, or how you speak, isn't it? So why should you give up control for your pet? Any advice given to you or your pet should fundamentally serve you. This is very important. You should be doing what is right for your pet, not just because someone tells you to do so. And just like how you would take care of your own body, you can take care of your pet with the same diligence. Your pet and you are unique. Remember that you spend more time with your pet than anyone else. No professional, including your vet or expert, is ever going to be more knowledgeable about him or you than you. Ever. Bar none. Don't even take any excuses. Yes, you can work with them. But always remember that you are the expert of your life and your pet's life. Make their advice work for you. Professionals only know what they're taught. Medicine, uh, so vets, we learn about medicine. Behaviorists learn about behavior. Trainer learn about training. Breeders know about breeding. And pet shopkeepers know about pet food. No one knows you 
or your pet better than you. Always remember that, take charge. So here are some tools that's available for you to be in charge. Google, Dr. Google. In the past, you know, there were textbooks that you could buy, you could read and see through the jargon and understand more if you could be bothered or had the time to do so. Uh, knowledge was exclusive to those who require, uh, so who received the education usually paid either in university or apprenticeship. It is usually passed from uh, through a spoken word like someone had to tell you if you were not, tell you about it if you're not privy to that sort of information before. That time has come and passed. Google launched in 1998, and since then, the way information is shared has completely changed. Google is a wonderful tool and at the same time, a complete waste of time and possibly destructive if used wrongly. Knowledge has never been more abundant and available at your fingertips. Instantly, you can find out different causes of excessive drinking like polydipsia and excessive urination or polyuria to characteristics of a squamous cell carcinoma, which is a type of cancer. Or maybe you're interested in the components of a vaccination, the side effects of any drug, or clinical science, or, or, or sort of a clinical science of acromegaly, excessive growth hormone. Your eight-year-old niece can find that out for you. Google has made any knowledge base value redundant and obsolete. It is not unfair to say that if you conducted research in any topic regarding the health of your pets with finesse and understanding, you would actually certain, uh, certainly be more knowledgeable in that particular topic than your vet. Your vet is only human. With all this vast information, vast more information in the world, it is impossible and inhuman to know everything at any one time. There's new technology, new research is being presented often and previous results are being debunked and contradicted, uh, and contradicted frequently. Even your vet uses Google. Dr. Google has made the, exclusive, uh, the exclusivity of knowledge disappear. The playing field is almost completely level. You no longer need to go to your vet for information. I no, no longer need to go to the library to review research papers. No more trudging through sort of a thick, dusty pages. No more. Knowledge is no longer exclusive. Anyone with access to the internet is included in the club. Now, the downside. It has been said that knowledge is abundant, but wisdom is scarce. With Google, the cost of entry to acquiring knowledge is extremely low. So anyone, everyone can access the knowledge and become so-called knowledgeable. Just like martial arts or playing a musical instrument, just because you know all the moves or all the keys on a piano, it doesn't mean that you can defend yourself or play Mozart. It is important to be able to see and filter through the information available to you as you represented with so much information written by anyone. In the past, there usually was a village idiot. He was recognized for what he was, an idiot, and not much attention was actually given to him. Now, the internet has made the village idiot gone global. Loads of inaccurate information is present too. It has never been more cluttered, more disorganized, and more contradictory. For any evidence supporting a fact, there will be the same amount of contradictory evidence. Where do you even start? The more you dig, the more you find, or you can get lost. Knowledge is no longer, no knowledge, knowledge simply no longer equates to clarity. Finesse and prudence are required to enable useful information to be obtained. Guidance is needed to know not what, but how to gather information. Avoid Facebook pages or social media in general, unless it belongs to an official body like your vets or a professional organization. And even then, take the information with a huge pinch of salt. You can look at information provided by reputable organizations like the BSAVA, the British Small Animal Veterinary Association, the BVA, the British uh, Veterinary Association, and such. You know, your vet may actually direct you to more useful and reliable sites. Basically, long story short, there are lots of free information available to you to enable you to understand what your pet and his conditions are. Those days where information is only privy to a few is over. 
learn and practice empowering yourself to be in charge of your bet. However, beware of false information present. Remember that the information gathered must serve your pet and you. If not, it could be a waste of time at best or even harmful in some situations. What about YouTube? You know, YouTube is the second most used search engine after Google. How to give a cat a tablet. You know, you can check it out on YouTube. The information is uh, presented in sort of video format. You can learn about raw feeding, how to groom your dogs, the best dog baits to buy, and all sorts of information from there. Similarly to Google, anyone can post information. So beware of who you are watching. Learning from a vet or vet-based channel may be helpful. Do beware that the information given is usually that person's opinion, whether he's a vet or not a vet, and there may be advances since that content was published. So same again, prudence and diligence are required to sort of uh, uh, ensure useful information gathered actually serves you and your pet, which is very, very important. Okay, what about examining your pet yourself? Forget internet, let's go back to your simple two hands, using your eyes or your God-given uh, gifts that you have. I'm gonna tell you a secret. Before vet college, most vet students, myself included, had no idea how to perform a clinical examination. We did not know how to count a heart rate, much less listen to the quality of the heart sounds or perform a lameness workup to find out which leg is lame doing certain activities. We did not know how to check hydration status or take a temperature. We simply didn't know. All these skills are, are, are sort of taught and hence can be learned. No one is born with skills. We learned that that is the good news. Please note that I am actually not trying to make a vet out of you. It takes years of training and experience to be good at a job and you will not replace your vet. However, you are able to do a lot of basic examinations on your animal, empowering you, giving you more power and more knowledge about your pet. You do not need to know how to examine every single pet like vets do, but you can certainly understand more about examining your own pet. I'm gonna share with you some techniques and tips to examine your dog or cat so you're in a sort of better position than before to assess his health. There are further content for sort of exotic species, but you know, uh, that's a totally different thing. We can come for another discussion for that. So first of all, it is extremely important for you to be practicing these techniques to gather information when your pet is actually well and healthy. So when he falls ill, you can actually see a difference. The more you know what is normal, the easier it is for you to pick up abnormal. Okay, it is hard to know what bad looks like if you do not know what good looks like. You have nothing to compare with. Okay, besides different pets, they have got different normal values, just like how your heart rate may be different from your friends, even though you're both doing the same thing. It's all just different. You need to find out what your pet's normal is. It also gives you the opportunity to practice how to do it. Just like cycling, it only gets easier each time you do so. So looking at his behavior, you know how your pet behaves better than anyone else in the world as no one else spend more time with him than you. If you think he's being less active, showing signs of unusual behavior, or feel something is just not right, you are probably correct to think that something is wrong. Believe in yourself and be brave to say that to your vet. Most vets would rather err on the side of caution than presume all is well. Check the breathing. You can count the number of breaths per minute by purely observing without touching a pet. Look at the ribs, count how many times they rise and fall in one minute. Make sure you're counting each rise and fall as one breath, not two. Yep. You can also observe how much effort is needed for each breath. Just like when we are healthy, breathing should be fairly effortless. Here's a little tip. You can count the number of breaths your pet takes in 15 seconds and multiply the number by four to obtain the breath per minute instead of waiting for one whole full minute. Please do know it is important to know what is normal for your pet, so please practice this technique when your pet is actually well. Checking the heart, same again, depending on the size of your pet, you may be able to listen to his heart by placing your ear on his chest. Usually a stethoscope is necessary. You can certainly get them online and the prices vary from less than five pounds to hundreds depending on quality. Remember, you just need a simple stethoscope. You're just listening to the heartbeat rather than trying to assess the quality of the heart sound. 
So by placing the stethoscope just behind the elbow, on the chest, on a dog or a cat, you can usually hear the heart. You can then count the heartbeat by counting the number of times the heart beats in a minute, similarly to how you sort of count um, the, the uh, breathing rate. And uh, you can also check the hydration, okay? That is, um, there are sort of two different techniques to do when you check hydration. The first one is to raise his lips and touch his gums. It should be moist, which is normal, and not bone dry, okay? If it's bone dry in the gums, it's possibly quite dehydrated. Secondly, you can pinch okay, the skin okay, behind his head, where your vet usually gives the injection, lift the skin up and release. Observe how fast the skin goes down. It should go down fairly fast. If it is slower than usual, then it may also indicate a bit of a dehydration. Ooh, checking the temperature. Okay, the most reliable method to know your pet's temperature is from its bottom, rectally, okay? You can buy simple human thermometers from a pharmacy or online. It usually costs less than 10 pounds. You can also apply a little bit of lubricant. You can use KY jelly or something like that. So it goes into the bottom smoothly. Your pet's temperature may be obtained that way. I found that the temperature obtained from a microchip or from the ears tend not to reflect the actual temperature. So it is anything between so one to three degrees lower than what the actual temperature is. So I, uh, I would certainly recommend taking it from the backside, okay? Um, usually it is actually preferable to take the temperature when your pet is resting because exercise can falsely elevate that, which also means that when you bring your pet to your vet, sometimes stress itself can artificially increase the temperature so that your vet may be running a fever or your pet may be running a fever when it's actually not. So it's actually quite useful to know what so-called the normal temperature is at home. Check in the weight. So it's a great idea to check your pet's weight regularly. If you're planning to diet your pet, okay, so whether to increase or decrease the weight, I would advise weighing him every two weeks. Okay, very simple. Every two weeks you weigh your pet because you know very, very objectively whether your so-called diet is working or not, okay? If your pet is of perfect body condition, I would advise weighing once a month. You have a small dog that you can carry, or a little cat, if you, have, uh, you can use your bathroom scales, stand on scales, carry a little pet, and see whether you can just minus off your weight. If you have a larger dog, certainly recommend them weighing them at your vets. You're also allowing him to go to your vets without being poked around, which may get him to be more comfortable when he goes to the vet the next time round. So checking the body condition score, BCS, you know, it is, this is more important than the weight as a correct weight really, really depends on whether, uh, depends on the shape and size of your pet, just like how your ideal weight may not be someone else's ideal weight despite being of similar age, height or size, okay? Please do refer to charts online for guidance. Simply Google uh, BCS or, you know, body condition score for dogs or for cats. If your pet is diabetic, it can be quite challenging and daunting. Not only are you unaware of your pet's current blood glucose level, he's relying on you to inject a fixed amount of insulin twice daily. If he misses those injections, then, you know, or he only eats half of his meal, or, or he misses a meal, you're not unsure whether he should inject the insulin or not, or to call your vet. You're unclear whether it's diabetes or due to other reasons. It can be quite stressful, but not after I've told you the secret. Do you know that you can check your pet's pet glucose level at home. You can obtain a glucometer, which is a small little handheld machine, okay, that tells you what the blood glucose level is, either from a vet or even from Amazon. Please bear in mind that different glucometers may give different slightly readings. It is extremely important to use the same meter for the same pet. What you're looking for is the trend rather than absolute value. Please do consult with your vet for exact details of how to interpret the readings before you try to interpret the readings, okay? The point being is that you can do it and arguably you should do it because if your dog or a cat have a so-called funny episode or does something abnormal like collapsing, with a glucometer, you can very easily find out what the blood glucose level is and determine if that issue is due to diabetes or something else. More importantly, when you call your vet, you will be able to give her this useful information which will result in a more relevant and effective advice to be received. So flea and uh, sort of flea and worm check, you can also do that whereby you can, uh, you, you can use a little flea comb that you can buy in any sort of large pet shop or online and check whether there's any sort of uh, fleas on your pet. And as for worms, uh, the classic area to check is the near the tail base on top, okay? That's where the classic area where the fleas uh, hide out. Then after that, you can tap the content, 
tap the content onto a wet piece of paper and see whether there's any redness of it. If there's redness, it could mean that there is sort of flea dirt or blood, which could also indicate a flea infestation. Um, you can also send your worm count. You can also send your worm count to uh, wormcount.com in UK. Okay, just to check whether there are certain worms inside there. So that's all fairly useful as well. Okay, so fundamentally, be more demanding. Remember that it is your pet. You are the CEO of your pet. Make sure you're getting everything you want for your pet. At least make appropriate informed decisions by demanding more knowledge and information. You're able to do so by approaching your vet, other paraprofessionals, or learning it yourself. Professionals and paraprofessionals, remember, they exist to help you and your pet, okay? Not the other way around. I'm going to tell you a little story. So Cynthia went to the salon to get her hair colored. At the start, she chose the color. However, when the dye was applied to her hair, the outcome was not what she had in mind. She was too embarrassed to speak out. And she sat there watching her hair, slowly changing to a color she did not like or want. The hairdresser continued on for the next hour as he did not know otherwise and felt he was doing a great job with his customer's permission. In the end, Cynthia regretted deeply as she felt she could and should have said something. She, could have, she had one whole hour to pick any moment, but she did not. So remember, you should always feel and be in charge and in control. It is your pet. Both he and you depend on it. So just like your body that you take complete charge of, your pet belongs to you too. Remember that. Do not compromise. Be more demanding and stay in control. You will not let someone else make decisions about things that matter to you, isn't it? Why would you make exceptions for your pet? So in summary, I just want to say, you know, you are amazing by just taking on and caring for a pet, being brave and being a pet guardian. So well done you. Be sure to be in charge of a pet. Remember, it is your pet in the end. So at this moment in time, I'm going to take questions. Please type it into your chat box. I can see there are a few different things right now. Okay, we've got a question for Jennifer, from Jennifer. The best way to use a glucometer on your dog. Okay, so very good question. So fundamentally, you need a little bit of blood. So you can get obtain blood in a lot of various ways. One uh, common areas would be on the ear pinna. So if that's an ear flap, okay, if that is the dog's ear, at the peripheral behind over here, there's a vein. Okay, so that is where you can do a little prick. So usually you can either use a little tiny hypodermic needle, which is what we use in the practice, or when you get a glucometer, they will come with a little uh, sort of a stamp stylus, so to speak, where you can just whack a little prick over there and that's where you can get some blood. So that is by far the most common way. Another way is actually in their pads. So they do bleed quite well from the pads as well. So you can uh, sort of hit the pad a little bit, then get a bit of blood and that's where you can get the um, blood sample for a glucometer. But what I would highly, highly advise you is when you get a glucometer, have a chat with a vet. Let them show you how to. They should be able to show you because the point being is that that's what they'll be using when they go to do a glucose curve on your dog anyway. So it's better to have someone show you exactly how it is done. I'm sure there are plenty of YouTube channels, but why don't you just speak to your vet about that, okay? How often will you do worm count? So I have, uh, you do it once or twice a year for both worms and lung worm and have recently tested both for Jardia. So um, depending on what sort of test you use, you have to be quite careful. So very good question for worm count. It depends on how, how high the risk is um, in your area. If it is quite prevalent that you can potentially get things like lung worm, then you may want to consider doing more often really because uh, the advice, put it this way, let's phrase it the other way around. So when we give wormers, we, one thing about wormers is that no wormers in the UK market have any residual effect, which means that it's all one-off kill. I can worm my dog on Monday and on Wednesday, if they pick up worms, they will continue to have those worms until the next worming session again. So in a high risk area for lung worm, that's why vets recommend worming monthly for lung worm because first of all, there's no residual effect to the worming medicine itself. 
it's just a one-off kill. And if they've got lung worm over there, there's nothing to say that, yes, you can do a, you can worm in January, or you can do a worm count in January, and it's negative, there's nothing to say that they won't get it in, in February. So it all depends on the area. So if it's a high risk area, you know, you may want to consider doing worm count more often, even monthly really, because that is what we'll be advising in terms of preventative medicine, giving worming, you'll be giving it monthly, okay? Just note as well for lung worm, okay, so depending on what lab you use, for lung worm, sometimes they do not show in the poop, you need a blood test for that, okay? So just be quite clear of when they say that they can find, they can check whether there's lung worm in the poop, just be very, very specific because from what I understand, sometimes you do not get it in the poop, but you need a blood test to actually check whether it's lung worm or not, okay? Uh, Giardia as well, is, uh, that's not exactly a worm, it's a little protozoa. So uh, you can certainly check that as well. So how often you need to worm your dog really depends, uh, wrong, how often you need to do worm count really depends on how risky you think your dog is in. Does that make sense? Okay, if it's a fairly clean dog, I don't want to touch anything, I don't eat poop, I don't eat snails, I don't eat slugs, now arguably the chance of them getting worm is much, much lower, especially if they avoid grass and things like that. But if you're a sort of dog that runs in the marsh, wetness, enjoy running in the river, things like that, your risk is much higher. So that is uh, that, really. Any further questions, type into the chat box, please. If not, I would like to recommend this particular book, which I wrote. Um, it is a, a little bit based on what we discussed earlier on. It is Aim for Pet Guardians to How to Develop the Best Relationship with a Vet, really. I don't believe there's any other book out there in the market that does that. So you can certainly get it on Amazon. It's available uh, Kindle, paperback, and also Audible. And that's our other little friend having that book. Let me just have a little look. Uh, yep, okay, very good. Near grass and what you can eat. Definitely worm more often or check more often. So the next, the next one is next month. I hope you enjoyed this. Next month, we are going to talk about best food for your dog. Super controversial. What food is best? Is there actually such a thing as bad food, best food for your dog? And that is the first Friday of next month. Uh, it'll be up on a Facebook post. So be sure to sign up if you want to come and learn more. And if you did enjoy this particular presentation, please do leave me a review on LinkedIn. Or if you have a Google, a Gmail, uh, go and Google drlennonfu.com over there and can leave me a message over there. I'll be extremely, extremely uh, grateful. Thank you very much for that. We've got one more here. Uh, okay, good. If there's no other, yes, before I go. <laughs> and this concludes the end of our presentation. I hope you found this useful. And um, Okay, what do you say about the increasing price in dogs this day? Will that continue? Are we talking about the puppies? So if you're talking about buying dogs these days, will it continue? Well, it is really a supply demand, really. Pure breeds, definitely. Uh, I, it really depends on where you're getting it from, whether people are actually exploiting the entire COVID market to increase the price because, well, it's back to the whole supply demand thing. If people are asking for it, then they'll increase the price up. People are buying it, then they'll be more confident to say that, wow, okay, if I call it at, used to be a thousand pounds, now it's 3,000 pounds, then yes, somebody buys it. Now like, okay, the market is now 3,000 pounds and let's put 4,000 pounds next month and see who's going to buy that. So the only way you can bring prices down without something random is very, very simple. Simply don't buy. If you don't buy anything, the prices have to drop. <laughs> and uh, dog thefts, yes, there's a lot. We know in Devon, there's so many dog thefts right now. So please do be careful with your dogs and uh, take care of them very, very well. There are dog thefts around, but yes. Apart from that, please keep safe, everybody. Thank you for your time this evening. And I hope you have a great weekend. And we hope to see you next month again. Bye-bye.